Hello, everybody. We're back again for more NFL. Uh, it's a lot easier to keep up with the NFL than to catch up on the NFL. And to help me with that, here are my friends uh, Ron and Ted. What's going on with you, Ted? Okay, Vegas Chris. I'm Ted Sobel with Ron Marmolevsky and Las Vegas Chris. And this is volume two for us here on the Inside Blitz. I think we're going to cover some stuff that uh, we're getting right into because of the combine just ended. Uh, just everybody knows a little bit about us. Uh, uh, I've been with Sports USA Radio. I do the pregame and halftime and postgame shows for NFL Network Radio stuff for the last 18 years. And Ron and I have gone back and forth since for 50 years since uh, we went to Fairfax High School in L.A. And, of course, Las Vegas, Chris, wins every damn tournament in town. And you already know about him because that's why those million-dollar checks are sitting right behind him. And, mm -hmm. yes, and I have authored the book. Touching Greatness. Thank you, Chris, for putting that up. We do appreciate that. Now available on Amazon. Some great stories about a lot of things, including the NFL chapter. But let's talk about the combine, guys. It just ended. And, Rod, do you have some thoughts on how it affects things moving forward? Because a couple of guys truly stood out. Well, uh, like we've talked about before, this will be the 43rd draft that I will be covering. And this is the one I really have been looking forward to the most of all of them, because 12 months ago when we knew with the super seniors and everybody staying in college and uh, just knew right away that it was going to be a deep draft. So I took notes as usual. I looked at the combine and I take a lot of stuff away from the combine. However, I don't overreact like other people do. We saw the fastest combine ever. And the problem with that is that speed matters up to a point. If you take the top 10 runners in history on any position, only two of them actually succeed in the NFL. The 10 fastest times at the combine, two of them had more than a cup of coffee in the NFL. What you want to do is not run slow. So I'm looking at benchmarks. If a cornerback runs too slow, he has to turn into a safety or he turns into a bench warmer, or he shouldn't be drafted. If a wide receiver runs slow, they better be very big, very tall, make the contested catch, because they're not going to have separation in today's NFL. So I'm not necessarily um, uh, somebody who cares about how fast they are at the top end. I just want to make sure they have a certain threshold. Well, so they're fast enough, right? They're, yeah, they have to be fast enough at any position. Cornerbacks have to cover wide receivers who know where they're going. Cornerbacks, it's not just speed. It's how fast, how easy can you flip your hips and turn and run with somebody? How fast can you change directions? The cone drills, the shuttle drills are more important in most cases than the speed. I got, you know, two things to ask you. What, what was up with the speed? uh adjustments that were happening i kept on seeing on twitter that you know everybody was breaking records with speed and there was adjustments made uh do you have any insight on that it, it seemed like uh times were really fast uh, was the ball juiced here was the watch juiced <laughs> yeah i know you kind of <laughs> feel that way because times used to go down you know they used to get slower not faster when they had the official time i heard they changed the turf that they redid the turf and that created a little bit more of a speed kind of thing. And I think some of the guys who didn't want to run might wish they, they did run on this turf in the apples to apples so they can compare themselves to others. Cause I heard that the new turf that was installed, haven't verified this, uh, did have some effect on the fast times. So, so is there any truth to the, go ahead, Rick, Chris. How often do, do these NFL players do all these things that they do in the combine uh, once their NFL career starts? I mean, it's really important that they know how to do this stuff because they're going to be doing it all again every year, right? The pass catching drills, the you know the gauntlet where they where they toe the line and they go across and catch five footballs or the out and up and so on. Those are things that are typically done in training camp in one training camp in one variety or another. But none of these guys are ever going to run a 40 again. And most of them are not going to lift again and all these other things unless they're rehabbing and they want to see where they are baseline in terms of strength and power. This is the last time an offensive lineman is going to do almost any of these drills. 
Yeah, one of the things I'm wondering is uh, the fact that Al Davis isn't around anymore. Will that affect picking up a fast guy? <laughs> Whereas we, we used to follow that very closely. On, uh, if he's fast, I want him, especially if he was a receiver, and it, whether he can catch the ball or not. Yeah. Well, different teams look at different drills, and different teams look at uh, different commonalities. If you take New England, they're not looking just at the drills. They want to know if you can play two positions. Can you play guard or tackle? Can you play in the box safety or free safety? Can you play cornerback or safety? They're looking to multitask the athletes they have. If you look at Seattle, they look at arm length. They look at wingspan. Each team, as long as they have an established GM, I've been able to cull some information about what they're looking for. And you mentioned the last week that this is the deepest draft ever. Uh, does the combine prove anything different? Um, no, it really doesn't. I looked at these people very carefully in terms of what positioning they were at when they were running the drills. Uh, we were lucky enough that the NFL Network showed the entire tight end group from start to finish without some of their crazy interviews and stuff like that. Um, what I see is that Again, the third, fourth, and fifth rounds are like no other draft that we've seen in recent years. 223 draft-eligible players on my board last year, which is fewer than the 256 people being drafted. 266 is my record. I'm, I still will expect when we get to the beginning of April when I put out my list that we're looking at 280 or 290, the most ever. And if you have 10, 11 picks in this draft, that's the way you want to go. And I have an example to tell you, a couple of examples, but the Jets last year traded from number 23 to number 14, and they gave up two third round picks, a very early third round pick and a later third round pick to move up to get an offensive lineman. I would say that was okay with last year's draft. Not a lot of great players. They needed an offensive lineman. This year, if you're giving up picks 66 and 86 to move up nine spots, that's not the right move because in the third round, you're going to get second round talent and the fifth round, you're going to get third round talent. The well, last thing on the combine, uh, does this mean that Forrest Gump is one of the guys that did well there or what? Yeah. Yeah. He could <laughs> run. If you, if you remember the film, you know, he really impressed and, you know, when he was, when he was running. Um, basically, stupid is as stupid does really is what I expect from the Houston Texans, what I expect from uh, the Carolina Panthers, the Saints and so on. They're going to make this needless trades, trades last year that were made, moving up from 73 to 70 and giving up a fifth round pick, moving up in the, in the top of the third round, but giving up two other third round picks. A team went from 98 and 105 to 76. Um, I'm just going to shake my head saying you just lost another starter. What did you do, you know, that ruined your team right now? Because these guys, this is going to be a draft that you're going to remember for a long time from rounds three to six. You know, I, I forgot to bring it up at the head of the show, but uh, we ended the last show with the uh, Calvin Ridley talk before the game yes. came out. Um, <laughs> you know, we, that was uh, odd timing there, but uh um, I just wanted to make a quick comment because there's been a lot of discussion on it. Uh, was the suspension fair? A lot of people think that it, it wasn't. And uh, I, I have no problem with it. You know, every in every locker room, uh, they have signs. You can't bet on your own sport. Um, you, they they have uh, symposiums uh, where they bring Absolutely. it up. Uh, they bring it up over and over and over again. And, you know, just because alcohol is legal doesn't mean you can drive, be a bus driver and show up drunk. So yeah. uh, I don't know how you guys feel, but did, did you guys feel that the, that's perfectly in order and, and see no issue with it? Absolutely. I, I totally agree with And Look, that, the rule is a rule. OK, you don't like the rule, change it. But that's the rule way it is now. Uh, to me, if you bet on an 18 parlay and you lose fifteen hundred dollars and, and give up eleven million, you deserve two years. <laughs> so <laughs> it's that's just yeah. stupidity, stupidity. I'm glad the NFL acted fast in this case instead of spinning their wheels like they do on some of these other things where they didn't know what the precedent was going to be and so on. They just said, no, you can't do this. And and then Calvin Ridley, he tweeted like four or five other things that said he just didn't get it. 
He yeah. just doesn't yeah. understand it. I, I, I think the only other thing that would concern me, I see it happening in hockey already, is the relationship between the players and the casinos. There's hockey players signing contracts with the casinos now. And that kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. And I, I don't really know how to articulate it well. We haven't seen it in the NFL that I'm aware of, but just something to keep an eye on down the road. But again, you know, uh, it, just because it's there, it doesn't mean you do it. it you can do it on other things. So, well, we opened Pandora's box by putting a professional team in Las Vegas. Yeah. We had that's a, what I was first, say. first, we had the hockey. Now we got the Raiders. And, that's where you say that's the reason they didn't want it in the first place. Now the question is, are you able to deal with reality here and and back off from the gambling end of it and just play your sport and not let that affect you from a from an odd standpoint? Stay out of the casino when it comes to going to the sports book and betting your sport. It's not difficult. Yeah, so one thing just came to mind and this is scary that this came to mind. The NFL draft is coming to Vegas. And yep. a lot of players are present and they're on stage at the NFL draft. You know, they have inside information of where they may be going in terms of the draft. Are they going whatever? Do they place a bet or have their friends place all these bets on draft props? Well, they could. Oh. But, you know, I guess the last thing on the topic that should be said is the, the, the people that said the gambling was bad for the sport. The, the what was supposed to happen actually happened perfectly. The player gambled and the casino sportsbook notified the league and it was nipped tuck right there. I mean, perfect, beautiful. That's Absolutely the way it perfect. Out. Total perfect. And you know what? That was the original idea of this as well is Vegas is the place that handles it the best. So they should be able to deal with all of this. They regulate everything better than anywhere in the world. So this should not be a problem. And if somebody wants to, to jump the shark on the rules, then you get what you deserve. That's it. And for people that don't realize, uh, gambling is a big, giant world with billions of dollars gambled. But let me just assure you, any suspicious or unusual betting activity yep. sticks out like a sore thumb for dollar amounts that are so low, it would shock almost everybody it does not take much to set off the alarm bells but the, on that note is the uh, is the drama over with the aaron Rodgers? finally can we move on what, I you hope. Say that? what else is there <laughs> he can't yeah. hold them hostage anymore so that's the good thing and you know whether he was doing it intentionally or not it still it it kept the entire league on hold until you really knew that had to be the first domino to fall now we sort of have a good feel for what we're going to do from here. And teams can go on and do whatever they're supposed to do because Aaron is no longer available. And the Packers got their franchise guy in Devontae Adams, and it's now full speed ahead. Yep, Nothing to add for me on this other than the fact that that whole Jordan Love fiasco is really biting them because – Pick number 26 was used for Jordan Love. People forgot, even I forgot, that they traded up to get Jordan Love at 26. They were the number one seed each of the last two years. You think they could have used an all-pro player with the 26th best player in either the 20, you know, the 2020 draft? Of course. So what do you do? You do you trade him? Does he have any trade value? What do you get? A third round pick for him? Well, um Chris could Chris could respond to this as well, but the two times in the last seven years that Aaron Rodgers got hurt and missed significant time, his worth was about nine to 10 points in the line in Vegas. And what did Green Bay go? One and seven, one and eight, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, so, they covered I mean, the last game. He, remember, the, they played Kansas City and easily covered. It was an awful yeah. game. Yeah, it was really bad. It was hard to watch. Yeah, from the standpoint of covering versus winning, the Green Bay franchise would rather win. And the problem is they groomed Love for two years. If they trade him, they're basically, well, of course, they're going to hope that their franchise quarterback never misses another game. But but at this stage, at his age, too, you know, stuff yeah. happens, obviously. It's football. Is he is Love ready to even be a decent backup? He's got to have one. 
I'm, this is the best case scenario for Love. He wasn't thrown into the fire because he was clearly not ready. He was not a strong quarterback in my eyes. You know, when I did that particular draft, this is you're going to see the best you can out of Love. Either he's good enough or he's not good enough. Personally, I think not so good. I don't think that there's going to be. A, I, there's a huge need for quarterbacks this year, obviously, but I have a feeling that that love is going to be ignored from teams reaching out to, Hey, are you willing to let go of him? I think that he's got, he's like a pariah, you know, by no fault of his own, just being mixed yeah. in that situation. Uh, he's just guilty by association. Uh, and that's unfortunate, uh, you know, because I think he's going to have a hard time being moved. What do you guys think? Yeah, I totally agree. Well, I mean, you have two test case scenarios as this slide says, Seattle, uh, no, not Seattle. Let's go Denver. Denver was in the market for a quarterback. Washington was in the market for a quarterback. Their choice, take one of the rookies this year or go with someone established. Denver wanted to make a splash. They did. Washington you know, made a ripple. It's certainly not a splash to go after Carson Wentz. But what these two teams, what these trades mean is that, yes, this is not a great year for quarterbacks, and the teams are starting to realize it. I was—I uh, I don't know what it is. I'm not a Denver fan. I'm not a Russell Wilson fan. But when I heard that news, I got excited. I, I think that's really cool. I'm—I'm mean, I'm going to look forward to seeing Russell Wilson there. I—I mm -hmm. I, you know the—I think that a lot of people feel like he was held back by Carroll. Mm -hmm. uh, Carroll wanted to focus too much on the running game and. And uh, wanted a uh, you know you know a simple offense so to speak. He wanted to grind it out, and it worked against Russell. So I'm going to be very interested to see Russell being able to do whatever he wants within reason in a new regime with an offensive line that can uh, protect them a little bit, and with a defense. It's going to be interesting. I like the way you said that. The, the people felt that he was held back. I think Russell felt that he was held back. That was the biggest yeah. issue. You know, just the fact that, okay, let me be me and see what I'm really, where is my ceiling at? We're going to find out a lot about him. And I think also look for more interceptions this year because I think he's going to take chances and he's going to try to be, you know, the a little bit more of a slinger. And I'm not so sure that's really what his game is about. Um, Pete Carroll's not an offensive mind at all. And so I think he, but he still knows the game. I think it's going to be an interesting view this season. You know, what what is the ceiling for this kid who's not a kid anymore? Well, Chris, you mentioned the offensive line, so let me piggyback on that. I'm The thing I'm going to be most curious at is where do sack totals go with Russell Wilson? How much of the number of sacks that he took in Seattle was due to the offensive line or due to the, his style of play? Denver's got a cohesive offensive line. These guys have played together, a lot of them, for three, four years and so on. Now we get to see whether or not Seattle makes, you know, it's Denver makes that kind of difference. And it's already being reflected, of course, in the NFL futures. You know, we've seen them cut in half in terms of realistic expectations or not realistic expectations to win the division, to win the, you know, the entire um, AFC and we're going to see that in season win totals in a month as well. By the yeah, way, not, go ahead, Chris. I just wanted to make a quick comment that, uh, yeah, if you missed the boat on uh, on betting Denver, uh, you know, just wave. You, you know, now's, <laughs> not the time, not, now's not the time to be, uh, you know, buying tickets on Denver because the, the books have overcompensated on that. And we yeah. probably should see uh, the lines get a little bit better over time as uh, – uh, some of the other teams start to take some attention away from Denver. What were you going to yeah, say? Yeah, I would Denver? think. Yeah, I, I was going to say I would have liked to have been a fly on the not on the wall, but on the shoulder of John Elway. The second that deal was made or the announcement was made that Aaron Rodgers is coming back, it wasn't very much time when all of a sudden that deal was done in Denver. And I'm wondering how how much they were on hold, saying, "Okay, if Rodgers says I'm not coming back." then it totally changes the league. And maybe Rodgers goes to Denver because Nathaniel Hackett's there. And not a lot of people are probably the timing of it. I think that the deals were already done. I think they already yeah. both knew what was going to go on. The, the timing was just too nip and tuck. But, you know, you brought up, Ted, about interceptions. Uh, 
that, you know, that's what they're saying about Aaron Rodgers. He's been too worried about his uh, MVP yeah. status and, and yeah. not throwing interceptions. And I think he would really benefit from taking a, a little bit more risk and, and being a little bit more. No doubt. Uh, Absolutely. He's got to, he's, he's got to quit worrying about his stat lines. What do you think, Ron? Uh, as Phil would have been saying for two, three years, he takes no chances um, he goes into these moods. He's very moody anyway, sensitive guy, introspective, grudge mode, whatever it is that he does. And it, it's a flaw in his game because he can rifle the ball in tight windows like almost there's maybe one or two other guys who could do what he does, but he doesn't want to turn it over. And I can understand in the red zone, you don't want to turn it over. You don't want to give up at least three points. But in the middle of the field, you should be doing that on third and eight and so on. I think it's held them back. Yeah. Well, you're talking more about the the playoffs, though. Because the regular season, I don't think it's affected them that much. It's the playoffs where it's killed them every single season. It so, does. you know, it, it doesn't affect them winning their division. It doesn't affect them being a, a top seed. It affects them as soon as the postseason starts. And then all of a sudden, you're scoring seven and ten points a game, and it's a whole different ball game. You can't do that. Well, they're they're playing higher quality teams, yeah, um, automatically, and you're also dealing with the fact that it's uh, you know one and done. You could be out otherwise, and you're dealing with the fact that Green Bay's had consecutive very bad drafts, so they have to rely on Aaron Rodgers to pull them through. And if he's not willing to take the chances against the better teams. There's not enough of roster clout for them to pull it off. And you know what? He also doesn't have the confidence in anybody else but Devontae. Everybody uh, he else. Likes Wizard. He likes Wizard because he runs precise patterns and Rodgers throws on timing. But you right. get the but Rogers... the, last time, the last time he threw to Lazard, I think he dropped the ball and then all of a sudden he didn't see another target. And I'm that's sure sort of Aaron's him. MO, you know? Yeah, they have a good relationship, so I'm not sure that was the case with him. I was, I was I was flabbergasted by the uh, the Wentz trade to Washington, and, and it would I couldn't believe it in the first place. Number one, and the fact that Washington they were going to cut him, he was going to be cut. The fact that they were there eating his whole salary and gave picks, I'm beside myself. What do you? Uh -huh. it, it it just seems ridiculous like george allen is back there right i'll take the older guy as opposed to a, a kid i what i don't understand is again he would have been a lot cheaper in any other scenario so why give up anything well, it's a forrest gump situation again washington has <laughs> done these kinds of things a lot you count on these franchises you know so that when i write up my draft report i get some humor in it <laughs> the leadership is the issue because Indianapolis has a quarterback who can make a lot of the throws. Um, I'm really saving the juicy parts of what I want to say about Carson Wentz for later if we go into divisional previews down the road. But basically, Indy realized they don't have a leader right there, and they wanted to cut ties. Um, they're not even – the weird thing about it is, is that Washington took on his entire salary, exactly, which freed a lot of money up for Indy. Yeah. What you know, I was shocked uh, to realize Indianapolis has had a different starting quarterback, yeah. it's either six or seven years in a row. It's yeah. flabbergasting to think about that. Yeah, well, yeah, and I, they've and they've won most of those years. Is yeah. Jimmy G, is Jimmy G a possible fit over there? Absolutely, I expect him to go to Indy. As a matter of fact, I think it's going to turn out to be uh, Wentz for Jimmy G when that pick's going to end up going to San Francisco and maybe, you know, whatever else they include in that thing. I fully expect him to end up there. Yeah, I tweeted that out a few days ago as well. Um, it's almost automatic for a third that can escalate into the second or whatever. Jimmy G's trade value went down a little bit because of the surgery, uh, but he's not going to be throwing any balls now. So they know what kind of locker room presence San Francisco really stood up for him. Nobody really stood up for Carson Wentz and Indy. So there may not be that much of a difference with the two talented, you know, the talent between Wentz and Jimmy G, but there's a difference in the leadership. All right. So Las Vegas is all about shuffling cards, but now we're talking about draft shuffling here. Uh, how does this all affect what's coming up in the next few weeks? Oh, boy. 
Well, Kenny Pickett was <laughs> was pretty much Washington was was the destination for Kenny Pickett, and Washington just said, "Kenny, you're not coming here." So does Carolina take him at six or take any quarterback at six? Um, you don't have it in front of you, but Carolina has a first round pick, and then their next pick is in the fourth round. I'm not and they're wasting dangling a pick McCaffrey. On a, they're dangling yeah. McCaffrey. So can, yeah. what does that mean? Well, it mean you want to have as many picks as possible in this draft. And if you're going to draft a quarterback on speculation at pick six and then not not enter the draft again until the fourth round, you're basically giving a new coach and a new GM this pick because Carolina is not going to be going anywhere because they're not improving their team in a deep draft. I don't know when the first quarterback come, comes off the board now. Is it 20 at Pittsburgh, which would be crazy? Wow, wow. that's amazing. Is it Seattle? Seattle's has Seattle nine, nine now. You, Seattle at nine is probably going to, you know, might yeah. take and if I'm Seattle, I'd rather wait till 40 or 41 personally. And I think it's in their MO to wait till 40 and 41. So you're probably going to see a team trade up ahead of Pittsburgh to get the first quarterback. And now this is, is going to be the first draft that we're aware of that it ends up being you go for a guy eventually because no one stands out. And there'll be several quarterbacks available in the second and third round as opposed to we got to get this guy now because we think. He's going to be at least special, if not great. Yeah, you, you wait. If you're Detroit, your only dilemma is you have Detroit has picks 32 and 34. The argument for taking a quarterback at 32 is you get a fifth year option on him. That's the only difference there. I'm a little bit of salary bump, but that doesn't matter at 32 versus 34. Uh, a lot depends on what you think will happen with pick 33, anticipating if you're going to miss out on somebody. But if you're Detroit, why would you even worry about a quarterback now? You pretty, I mean, you're only looking at a backup anyway for, for the next couple of years. You get, you need a lot of players on your roster. I don't think they're going to go with a quarterback this year. Uh, I, 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 Makes no you sense. Know, a lot of people don't realize that Goff, after the uh, Lions had the bye, was one of the best quarterbacks, uh, you know, stat wise. He, he was on a roll until uh, he got injured uh, late in the season. So I think. You know, he's ingratiated himself to the Detroit fan base and uh, coaching staff. Yeah. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be upset if they skipped a quarterback this year because the, the boom bust factor of all the quarterbacks. But if they took one but drafted well in other areas, I'm OK with that, too, because we could say some very nice things about Goff, but he also has a ceiling that's not all that high. Exactly. Would you? Would you put McCaffrey on the trading block? See, my personal opinion is get rid of him. He, I have a feeling he's just going to get injured every year. I don't think mm -hmm. he's going to be a full-season player. Well, how much of that is also how they use him? Because let's face it, he was like their only guy, and they try to use him on every play. And I want the ball in his hands on every play too. To me, he's the best overall offensive player in the league, but if he only plays four games a year, who cares? So it's how you use them. Can you save them? Can, we, we talked before about uh, about the, the, the length of the season and using guys a little bit less. I think he's the perfect example of that. Running backs do not usually correlate to playoff success or even making the playoffs. You want an interesting stat? Can you name all the running backs that have been with their original team more than six years right now? No, but I also don't think of McCaffrey as just a running back. No, I don't yeah. either. That's so, that's the bonus. Um, there's like well, three a giant bonus. That's who he is. Three or four guys that you could keep, and McCaffrey is one of them because he has the three tools, running, blocking, receiving, especially receiving. There is one running back on a team right now that has played more than six years with his original team. And there's only three, I believe, that have played six years or more. The one running back is not even a starter. It's James White out of New England. <laughs> it's okay. weird. I just had this thought like uh, not that long ago because when you get to the next uh, topic, when we're talking about franchise people, I have a comment about that. Running backs just do not move the needle. It's McCaffrey. It's Delvin Cook. It's Kamara, although Kamara has legal problems. There's like four or five running backs total that move the needle. So if McCaffrey's traded, you know, it's just so rare to see running backs be effective when they're 30 or more years of age. 
Right. Well, I, to me, if I'm maybe somebody like a Pittsburgh is what I'm thinking. If they could trade for a guy like that and then use him the way you need to, don't overuse him. Uh, he could be huge for them. Specifically, not going to be Pittsburgh. No, what I'm saying is, but we don't know who their quarterback's going to be. So they need somebody to do something up on the offensive side. I think they when we're looking at one, when they we're looking at franchise player, when we're talking about quarterbacks and the, the drought of quarterbacks, take a look at the franchise players. You've got two tight ends already franchised. There's no tight ends. Uh, Three of them. There. They want to be protected. Right. But so what about the these franchise that's... guys? Ron, well, well, uh, listen to this. Yeah. Um, with with tight ends, the playoff teams tended to have at least an average, if not a well above average tight end. And and can you find a team that didn't have a good tight end that went, you know, won a first round game in the playoffs or anything? Tight ends, people are now understanding the value of mismatches at tight ends because they're faster. They're used more as wide receivers, but they're better blockers than wide receivers. Um, there's a reason teams want to stick with a quality tight end, Miami in particular, because this Gusecki is an up-and-comer. What about the uh, the free agents that are available? Uh, here's our segment. We're going to spend, what, two minutes on each free agent that's available here. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we'll finish at the end of the season. <laughs> 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 the viewers may not be able to read this. We can't read this, but this was <laughs> an, an idea. The uh, as Ron said before the show, uh, the, the turnover in the NFL is just absurd. Look at the volume. Uh, well, you know what? If you just look along the top row of all of this, you just see some great names there, like Von Miller, Bobby Wagner, Calais Campbell. I mean, we're just talking about the top row of this, right? Leonard Fournette. Uh, to me, that would make a pretty good team just by itself. Uh, there's a lot of guys available. Age is coming into play here. By the way, how about Bobby Wagner? I mean, to me, the loss, his loss in Seattle is almost as equal to the to losing a guy like Russell Wilson because he means so much to that franchise. He is the leader of that team overall. And all of a sudden, he's gone. He, and he's still got something left. I would pick him up in a minute, whoever team. He gets his choice of teams, so he's going to go to a contender. Um, Green yep. Bay, somebody like that. Yeah, maybe. Gobble up this guy. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe the best locker room guy in the league. I love that. I love your list, though, Chris. That is <laughs> one of the great depth charts of all time. <laughs> what, what's you up have with to know what your drafts. My, my timeline on Twitter is filled up with all these links for mock drafts. And no, I no. find it absolutely ridiculous. I mean, they are absolutely meaningless. As a Lions fan, you know, all my Lions follower, you know, uh, media, you know, guys that tweet out the, the mock drafts, I'm like, there's no way in hell this is, can mean anything. There's no way <laughs> you know what they're going to do at 32 and 34. They got to fill time. They got to fill space. That's all it is. It's just filler. Who cares? Yeah, Ron, do you do you, do you do you look at the mock drafts at all at this point, or they they don't they just don't matter until April hits. They don't matter until April, and and even when I see them in April, I shake my head, you know, stunned <laughs> that somebody goes here, somebody goes there. I mean, I've studied this lots in far greater detail than these people are putting out these mocks, but I use them in terms of okay, that's the public perception on these players. You know that. You know, not not necessarily the run of the mill mock, but there are mock draft scenarios that are going on with every GM in every war room in terms of the NFL because they want to know if their player or players they're getting. You know, a lot of a lot of teams are going to target three or four players for wherever their draft stock is. They want to know what the general consensus is out there, what the buzz is out there. Do we have to trade up, trade down? Do we? Do we really think that this player is going to drop to our place? So they have a meaning, but as far as accuracy, please don't even consider it. Right, well, how about the meaning of just affecting player props when it comes to the draft uh, uh, draft props? That's yeah. got to a, the, the key guys, the big names, that might give you total value throughout. 
Yeah, if I disagree with them completely, especially if they're well-known, whatever, I'm going to say, wow, that person's going to be overpriced, but somebody else is going to be underpriced. Yeah, yep. I'm looking at it for those kind of value exactly. situations. I'm not looking at it for accuracy. <laughs> so is anybody excited about any Watson news? He has not been charged with a crime. It's been over a year. Um, you know, something's got to happen at this point. Uh, um, I think he's going to be good to go. Uh, what are you guys hearing? I totally disagree. I don't think he's good to go at all. First, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, how many cities are going to want him as the face of your franchise right now? It is bad PR for your team. Now, if there are some teams that they're sort of on the, the lower end of the spectrum, then fine, good luck, whatever. But nothing's been established yet. I wouldn't touch him. And I'm not going to say there's a double meaning at all on that. <laughs> you know, bottom yeah. line is, how do you bring this guy into your franchise even without even knowing from the legal standpoint? And the league is going to have a suspension probably on top of It's not one woman is involved. I think it's 21, right? This is far from over. I think you can't, you cannot trade for him now. And if you yeah, do, it, I think you're insane. But if you're Houston, don't you have to play him if he's allowed to play? No. No. What if, no. What you, you pay him to sit? Yep. No, you know, I first of all, Watson has to come halfway with this too, because he hasn't waived his no trade clause and he's right. he's he thinks he holds the cards and, and saying where he wants to go. Not at all. There's only one place that I could see that makes sense for him right now that I would trade for right now. Cause I agree with, with what you said about the suspension, the NFL is going to come down somewhere between eight and 16 games or 17 games. Yeah, the best case scenario is that he'll be playing in mid November of 2022. The likely scenario is 2023. And I think right. Carolina is the fit for him. It's in North Carolina. It's not, I think, I think it's not a gigantic city. I think they could live with him, especially if he's suspended and they get used to it for a little while. Carolina needs to have a franchise quarterback other than what's available in the 2022 draft. Um, I think that's the, the scenario that I tweeted out, and that's where he needs to go. And by the way, assuming, and it's a giant assumption, that he's not in jail, which is possible. Mm -hmm. And then his career could be done. So why would you trade for a guy like that? I wouldn't get near that trade. Yeah. Well, we have free agency starts next week, so we're going to be following up with that. Uh, yep. We're going to – we're going to. are we going to look at the AFC East next week? We can do that. I'm ready to go. Okay, but well, we're definitely going to be talking free agency. We're going to be talking draft needs and draft thoughts, preliminary-type looks. And uh, as a – Mentioned down there at the bottom of the screen, the NFL offseason is more interesting than baseball. So we're going to be keeping track of, <laughs> of all the breaking news. Uh, well, well, finally, there is no more baseball offseason. So now uh, we can we can move on with our season, which never ends. The NFL just goes on and on and on. Uh, to me, free agency is going to be so fascinating. I mean, we're going to go – it might be like a couple-of-day period where all of a sudden – everybody's opinion changes with the team because they picked up one or two key guys. Will be. Any final thoughts, uh, Ron? Um, nope. Um, it's going to get busy season for me. I'm already, uh, I've populated my spreadsheet with everything, comments, scores, everything with the draft. So it's a little bit of a lull for three or four days because then we got the free agency and then I got to match the team needs to what they did with the free agency and, and then we're going to have some fun with this. Yeah. How about odds, though, Chris? Uh, do you are you seeing uh, any changes at all over what's gone on in the last couple of days in Vegas between uh, the moves of Aaron Rodgers saying he's staying, a couple of the key guys like Devontae Adams make sure he's staying, and now with Denver. Yeah, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the Denver made quite the move, uh, and 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 when Rodgers was announced, actually the Denver odds went way up. Uh, for an hour, and then they announced yeah. Wilson, and then they came back <laughs> down. So, and uh, Green Bay odds were kind of indicating that he was going to be staying there anyway. So, uh, uh, it's pretty much the same. But uh, okay. we'll be that's keeping an eye on those in future shows. Yeah, that's what I want to watch, especially the next month or so. And as soon as the the schedules come out, 
that's when we'll really get a focus and get a feel for, okay, are these odds realistic? I, that's what I'm looking forward to. Well, I guess that wraps it up. I appreciate anybody that joined us, and uh, we're going to uh, try to keep this up. We might actually be adding some additional short uh, version content, uh, uh, whatever comes to mind. Uh, so we're not going to stick with any particular strict format or anything. Uh, we don't, you know, time is valuable, so we don't want to be wasting our time or or any of the viewers' time. So. Uh, until next show, we appreciate everybody. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ted. Uh, we'll Thank see you. you soon. Thank you.